Cities are inherently local, and places where a region comes together, people engage in commerce, education, and human ingenuity flourishes. So transit systems are naturally responses to the problems faced by a particular place, whether that place be Toronto, Vancouver, Shanghai, Buenos Aires, or Lyon. When a person in any one of these cities is planning a new subway or tram line, they're thinking about that city right in front of them. But this YouTube channel, and transit as a whole I'd argue, is a global thing, and I think it's at its best when it fully embraces that. While there are hundreds of languages spoken around the world, getting on a train or a bus is a surprisingly universal experience. And sometimes, stepping into a subway far from home, you can briefly feel like you never actually left. Unfortunately though, it's still far too common for people who are passionate about public transport, and yes, even who work in the industry, to be unaware of what goes on beyond their borders. And that might not be their national borders, but the borders of their city. I'm always surprised by how many people I've met in Toronto over the years who haven't been to Vancouver or even Montreal, much less Tokyo or Paris. And so today, I want to get at the core of what I do, why transit should be as global as it is local, and why that's such a powerful thing. Welcome to RM Transit, a channel about public transportation around the globe. Consider subscribing to help me keep spreading the word about public transport the world over. Public transit exists around the world, and while there are a lot of varieties of public transit, the basics tend to be pretty similar. You see the same transit modes, be it metro, bus, tram, high-speed rail, similar designs, whether they be for maps or station layouts and even sometimes these same companies doing work in cities which are thousands of kilometers apart. But unfortunately, far too often this global lab we've been given goes unused. I think one of the biggest benefits of the global extent of public transport is that you can make these crazy comparisons between cities that are across the world from one another, and actually analyze where they do things differently and where they should maybe try to be a bit more the same. Go from Seoul to Melbourne to Sao Paulo to Johannesburg and New York, and you'll see electric trains, platforms, and even icons and signs that look shockingly similar, even if they're sometimes in different languages. Sort of like if each city has come up with its own flavor on a recipe it probably didn't originate. But when you look deeper at how the service is operated, but also the technical differences between the trains, track, and power systems, not to mention how the actual services are integrated into a broader network, you realize that there's actually a lot that's different between different cities. Cities have taken disparate tools, merged them into a common, universalized, global understanding, and then sculpt entirely different systems and networks using them. Just contrast how Melbourne suburban trains terminate in a loop around the city center, New York stop in random locations in the urban core, and Seoul's merge into other urban railways as they head towards the city center. So much of what I do on the channel is trying to determine where these differences are a problem. Like with New York's insistence on terminating tons of regional trains at massive underground stations that use up some of the world's most valuable real estate. Where they might be good, like Seoul repurposing opportunistically urban rail infrastructure to handle trains coming from just beyond the urban region, and where they might just be an anodyne different way of doing things, like with Melbourne's city circle that connects regional trains through its city centre in an odd looping pattern. Something which seems odd at first, but which is more reasonable, if still odd, when you better understand the city's history and its unbalanced geography. And you can really drill down on this stuff. Just thinking about the idea of a cross-city tunnel, there's so much more you can learn if you don't limit your context to a single city. Like say Paris, but instead look to cross-city tunnels around the world, you'll see how different cities and planners manage to use a similar solution to solve a similar problem, connecting trains from outlying areas through a city center. Be it by reusing subway tunnels as in Tokyo, linking entire networks together with a short, quad-track cross-city corridor like in Philadelphia, or by ultimately building expensive new heavy rail express corridors across the city, like with Paris and its RER. And when you end up looking around, you realize that different solutions don't only highlight different local contexts, but a different vision for what transit planners think that the future of their transit system, but also their city, will look like. If you aren't familiar with cities around the world, then you're probably not going to be familiar that the same problem appears in city after city after city. But you also probably won't realize that there's not always total agreement on how to actually solve it. Planners working in their own city will probably be able to come up with a much better solution if they're aware of what other cities have done and whether it went badly or not. 
Of course, it isn't just mega projects which share a common thread. Right down to the nuts and bolts, or buses and trains as it were, there's a shocking amount of global commonality. So much so that you can see almost the exact same metro trains operating in Australia, India, Canada, and France, and soon in Chile. But, as I've talked about in my various videos about buses, when places abandon that global commonality, you can have a lot of problems, as so often happens in the US and Canada. And what's kind of remarkable is that you might have a populace and even an industry that doesn't actually realize how much better things could be. Imagine if, say, car designs were so different from continent to continent that North American cars still used only seven segment displays for everything, while cars in Europe and Asia were using big LCD touchscreens. You probably can't imagine that happening, but it does happen for buses. And I think that gets at the core of why I do what I do, and why you, if you're a transit activist, or a planner, or even just a transit lover, should want to know what's going on over yonder, even if you're never planning on leaving your hometown. The reason, I think, is because it can expand our ideas of what's actually possible. For example, if you've never seen Hong Kong's giant developments on top of train yards, you might not think that's something you could do. And even while I'm skeptical about bus rapid transit, these networks clearly do show us just how far buses can be pushed. Switzerland even shows us that you can schedule transit for an entire country, and how that can actually be done. And even if you're not going to emulate Bogota, or Zurich, or Hong Kong, knowing what they have and can do changes the way you think about the solutions to your own city's problems. And being able to have that global outlook, well, it makes transit better, everywhere, locally. Thanks for watching.